again, the, the supply demand balances for later this year look terrifying. I think that we end up in a situation like, let's say, 1979, where we see oil prices spike to all time highs and we end up seeing demand destruction because of such a significant price spike. And then we see prices start to pull back and because of ultra high prices negatively affecting demand. Will the price of oil free fall into a recession or are we due for a comeback? This is the theme of our discussion with Josh Young. He is a CIO of Bison Interests, primarily invested in the oil sector. Josh, welcome to my show, The David Lynn Report. Pleasure to host you today. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Before we start, your fund had an excellent two years in a row. Just, just tell us your performance because it was incredible. And um, generally speaking, what you've done to achieve those returns? Yeah, sure. So um, we were <laughs> we were up three hundred and forty nine percent net in twenty twenty one, and then um, I actually have to look up the exact performance. So I think around forty five or fifty percent net in 2022, uh, a little less memorable. It's it's funny, people say that uh, 2022 was a great year for oil and gas, but actually uh, we, we did better at a time where people went from hating it to disliking it than from when they went from disliking it to liking it a little bit more. So uh, it's, been, it's been good so far and we did it uh, through investing in small cap, mostly publicly traded oil and gas equities, uh, finding ones that have um, either assets that are sort of hidden or underappreciated or where there was some other sort of catalyst or inflection that allowed them to materially outperform versus uh, other oil and gas equities and the broader market. Well, 2022 was a very interesting year. It was a volatile year, year for, for oil. There was a huge spike run up to above $120 a barrel. And then it just petered out and came back down. I, I like to talk about your outlook for the oil markets going forward today. And, uh, and specifically, what you think oil is going to do during what many economists are saying could be a recessionary period later in the year or perhaps next year. Now, there's two forces at play. One could argue that there's going to be lower demand for oil if the economy slows down. But I've also heard arguments from commentators in the oil sector that perhaps the inventory levels are decreasing or are low. And so that could actually boost up the price of oil. So let's let's break down the uh, demand and supply fundamentals here. Yeah, so uh, it's been interesting. This whole rally for oil has been hated. I think there was a brief moment where people felt comfortable or safe owning oil and gas, which frankly was a point we were actually trimming our holdings a little bit uh, around uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, where you know prices spiked. There was concern around a, a large drop in um, supplies of oil from Russia. But but for the, the rest of us, it's been probably one of the most hated bull markets for oil in history. History. People are still convinced that it's going away as demand is rebounding to pre-COVID levels. And it looks like we may be on track this year to hit all-time high demand levels. Um, and there have been different narratives and sort of different ways that people express have expressed hating this bull market. And it's gone from oil is going away and people are going to work from home forever and China is going to stay locked down forever to now this recession narrative, which has gone on for a little more than a year. And, and so I think it's just it's important, like you're you're suggesting, to sort of clarify. Uh, so on the demand side, demand is strong despite what looks like actually a recession right now here in the U.S. and also uh, a recession or a recovery from a recession in Europe and a very weak industrial economy in China. So we're near or at all time highs for demand right now, despite what looks like a recession. And even if things get worse, uh, it does look like demand is sort of uh, structurally recovering rather than sort of cyclically recovering. And then on the supply side, there are severe supply limitations reflective of a long underinvestment in oil and gas uh, productive capacity. And so I think we're, we're entering this period where even if there's real economic challenges and further challenges than we're already seeing, uh, we may actually be in an undersupplied market. So I think there's sort of these, these countervailing forces, like you're saying. And I think even if there is a recession, if it's not the worst recession in the last 60 years, uh, and it's not global, if it's sort of more local to the US and Europe or to several other regions with other regions growing, we, we may actually see oil prices rise on the back of an imbalance in this uh, demand and supply equation. 
A couple of weeks ago, OPEC Plus announced uh, supply cuts by the order of around 1.16 million barrels a day. And uh, the price immediately shot up, although it didn't sustain that level. Now, was the price actually reacting to OPEC's announcement? Do you remember a couple of weeks ago? Yeah. So, I mean, that was interesting, too, because they announced a surprise voluntary cut. It wasn't a formal OPEC plus cut. It was a, a voluntary cut across the members. And um, it was, I think, technically more than that. It was close to 1.6 million, uh, including Russia. But Russia had already committed to that 500,000 barrel uh, export and production cut. Um, but Russia has said various things around their exports and has not followed through. Russia is sort of surprised to the upside. So I think people are really not giving Russia very much credit in terms of for how much uh, they may actually cut their exports and cut their oil production. Um, and like you're saying, oil prices did rally. And like we were chatting about right before we turned this on, uh, you know, oil is now basically back to where it was before OPEC announced their cut. And again, it's very, it's very surprising. There are many different explanations and hand waving and narratives around, oh, OPEC cuts are bearish because of X, Y, or Z. It really just comes back to that same question of, hey, is the market undersupplied or oversupplied? And under whatever circumstances one thinks are happening right now and may happen in the near future, will the market stay undersupplied or will it go into oversupply? And so I think just very simplistically, just treating OPEC at face value and allowing for, let's say, half the cuts that they're claiming since it's voluntary. And since their last cuts, they only cut about half of what they said they would. Um, you know, if you if you give them credit for like 800,000 barrels a day out of this 1.6 million announced voluntary cut, you're going to be in a real, a real tough situation again from a supply and demand balance. And what I think is going to happen is I think OPEC is cutting ahead of what may be an even tighter market later this year, where they may have some room to actually reverse and add supply to a very tight market as prices are much higher than where they are right now. So I think I think we're sort of entering in this weird period. There's many different narratives that all sort of surround around like negative macro, negative uh, economic uh, activity, economic weakness, recession, various ways people say it. But there's also just a very simplistic, you know, commodities don't always move with the broader economy or the stock market. And in this case, oil really, I mean, it looks like the 70s where you may end up with a bad economic downturn and much higher oil prices rather than much lower oil prices. Okay, we're, we're going to come back to that uh, because that's a very important point you just made. I want to talk about uh, news coming out of February. Congress has mandated uh, the U.S. to sell oil from its strategic petroleum reserves. Um, it was supposed to sell 26 million barrels of oil. And I wonder if this has any material impact on the uh, supply fundamentals. I mean, it has a little bit. I think it's hurting sentiment that, um, you know, the Biden administration has talked about buying oil back into the strategic petroleum reserve, which they aggressively sold down right ahead of last year's election. And they haven't done so. So I think there was some expectation. I didn't think they were ever really going to buy in size. They bought a couple million barrels and people pointed to it and said, oh, they're following through. But they were supposed to buy hundreds of millions of barrels and they didn't. And here they are selling more. And, and yeah, Congress did indicate it and it, it was um, sort of ordered by Congress, but the president uh, and the energy secretary, they could actually go and buy oil for the SPR that would sort of counteract the sales and, and they could be building up based on sort of what they had said. And I think one of the triggers for OPEC, in addition to rebuilding their spare capacity to be able to better supply the market when it's tighter later this year, I think another motivation may have been sort of a geopolitical one where when the Biden administration sort of uh, welched on their promise to repurchase oil for the SPR, um, I think I think there was just sort of this this view that, hey, we need to stand up for ourselves from a sort of power and positioning perspective. I'm not sure that it actually matters that much in terms of the medium term uh, market and the medium term price for oil that OPEC is cutting now and likely to increase production later this year. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of concern around perception and around control of the market. And I think I think OPEC and particularly the, the Saudis really want to uh, position themselves as in control of the market to actually ironically reduce uh, 
price volatility and encourage investment. And so um, I'm not sure if they're being su successful with that, but that does seem to be another motivating factor that's maybe secondary versus the fundamentals and the desire to have a market that's not too imbalanced. Uh, you likened what could come to uh, the 1970s, the late 70s, the oil crisis we saw then. Um, it was a very severe time for not just the oil sector, but the economy overall. It, it, it caused severe inflation. But the fundamentals back then, do you see any similarities to now? Keep, keeping in mind that the oil crisis was cut, was, was caused by basically a collapse of production from OPEC. But now, of course, the U.S. has production of its own, like shale. Yeah, I think I think history doesn't, they say it doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. So there, there are similarities and there are differences, but I think sort of the reason to point to that is that there is this idea that recessions necessarily mean price collapse and price collapses in commodities like oil. And that was a market where, again, excluding the sort of specifics and looking at the high level general, there was X amount of demand and Y amount of supply and the supply was insufficient relative to the demand. I think in that way, it's similar. And so we've already seen a price move down in oil that's sort of similar to what you saw in the late 70s before that next sort of wave of higher prices and higher oil drilling activity that you saw a kick off in 79. And so I think you've sort of seen recession arguably already priced in, maybe overpriced into the oil market at this point. You can also see it in the futures activity where net speculative interest is down tremendously and the short interest in oil futures, especially in the WTI side, is up substantially. And so you sort of see the market already positioned for this. And you know, due to the increase in indexing, along with uh, the number of funds that are focused on momentum trading and trend following, we may actually see we may have seen an exaggerated move in the price down. And again, when you look at it, there's just this big debate of, okay, is the price right or are the fundamentals right? And I'm firmly in the camp of the fundamentals and I track the track the supply and demand and track inventories. And it really, I mean, there's just not the fundamental uh, supply to justify relative to demand. And there's just not the inventories to justify this price move down. And if anything, I think it's a great opportunity to be able to buy sort of in the face of these momentum and trend following strategies and in the face of very negative headlines that are not consistent with, again, the actual demand, the actual supply and the actual movements and in inventories. I was reading a um, commentary from uh, Eric Nuttall, and he said that uh, oil could go to above $100 a barrel and stay there. Is that a sentiment that you share? So I think I think we'd all like that from an oil equity investor perspective. Like if it could, oil could go to 100 and just stay there, that'd be great for these businesses. It's probably a sort of long run profit maximization. I think my view is a little different. I think that we end up in a situation like let's say 1979, where we see oil prices spike to all-time highs and we end up seeing demand destruction because of such a significant price spike. And then we see prices start to pull back and because of ultra high prices negatively affecting demand. And so I don't think it's very likely at all that we see a sort of stable flat price or even a sort of tight price range. I think it's much more likely that we see much higher prices and then potentially a period of lower prices uh, following that. So I think I think it's really a tough um, it's a tough situation to sort of think through and sort of model out. And I think a lot of the sort of um, a lot of the forecasters they're sort of scared to say, hey, oil might go to two hundred or two fifty. But there's just a reality, which is if you're in a market, I mean, the the highest estimate I've seen for undersupply is 5 million barrels a day. If, you, if you're if you in that, right, and the low is the EIA showing a 2 million barrel a day deficit for the second half of this year. So in between two and five, I mean, if you look at five, just consider it for a second, that's about a 5% undersupply in the market. And it's a commodity where when there's a small move, let's say a one or 2% oversupply, you can see price fall 50, 80%. So if you see a 5% undersupply, again, the there's, there's really, really small 
elast price elasticity of demand, you could see prices go just tremendously higher. So, you know, is a is a hundred a reasonable target for an average, let's say, over the next five years or so on an inflation adjusted basis? Maybe, but I just don't think it's likely that it's sort of this flattish path. I think we see sort of a takeoff, especially if there isn't a tremendous downturn. If if there's a downturn because oil prices rise a lot, again, that's going to hurt price too eventually. But I think it's just going to be much less sort of stable. And it's not about 100 or 90, 110. It's that oil prices probably need to go much, much higher in order to be able to, um, in order to allow the market to clear and to stop having these global inventories from collapsing. What do your models tell you in terms of how high it could go before retracement? So, so it's not it's not like a particular oil model that we're running. So we look at a number of them. We try to actually not build our own proprietary model just because uh, <laughs> my old intern, now famous uh, finance commentator, he likes to say that uh, models get you uh, to be precisely wrong. So what we'll do instead of uh, you know do, putting all that in and then really sort of marrying any particular model or particular result is just look at sort of the models that, that Wall Street's using, the models that the expert uh, forecasters are using and sort of look at the assumptions carefully and then see sort of what happens when we adjust the assumptions to things that we think are more reasonable and then come with a come up with a sort of more likely out, output. And so what I think we're going to see is, um, I think I think there's just too much of an assumption of demand destruction and not enough of an understanding of limited supply. And again, that's where I think the OPEC news is much better understood. OPEC can be well understood for cutting here, not because there's insufficient demand today, but because they think the market's going to be even more unbalanced later this year or into next year. And so they see, I think, what I'm seeing and what others that are doing this work are seeing, which is it could get really ugly later this year, but in the opposite direction that speculators and trend followers and momentum investors are are betting right now. So I think I think there is this sort of really interesting setup. But again, it's not about our particular models. It's about just understanding the assumptions that folks are making. And very few, there are a few um, you know, uh, industry experts that that are identifying this issue in the ultra high demand versus consensus. And frankly, one of them, they just admitted that they they were the high end of the sort of, you know, investment banks and experts that are quoted or cited for different demand estimates. And they underestimated demand so far this year. So so it's really been very strong. And again, I know it sounds very weird because price is down and sentiment is down. And you know, there's just all these narratives around demand destruction and recession, but then there's just the actual data and the actual data is really strong. And one thing I think you and I talked about in our last interview was the flight rebound in China and activity rebound in China. And I think folks just have such a negative view on China, for example, in terms of industrial activity, that they're ignoring that when you allow people to drive again and you allow them to get on flights and you start giving them visas and allowing them to fly internationally, you, you just have this tremendous boom even with a pretty weak economy in China. And so I think that might be one of the blind spots and one of those things where it's complicated, right? How do you explain to people that the Chinese economy is not doing great while <laughs> their oil demand is up because they're driving again and they're flying again? And so, you know, it's not it's not as simple or clear cut as I think uh, headlines indicate. And it's certainly not as simple or clear cut as these sort of trend following investors that are blasting oil futures down to you know, decade plus low uh, speculative interest are are acting on. I have to draw a, a parallel to 2008. Uh, you'll recall that the price spiked to almost $200 a barrel before it collapsed um, in the great financial crisis. I'll let you comment on why that happened, but I think some of it had to do with the fact that there was strong there was strong demand globally leading up to the financial crisis in the wake of. Uh, stagnating global production, which sounds awfully similar to the situation you're describing today. So can we make this parallel? Sure. And I think if you look at the price movement, I've looked at some uh, price parallel charts and shared some on Twitter and other places. And people get very upset because, again, history doesn't repeat that it does rhyme. And so if if it were to follow that path, I think what you'd see is that um, – that you'd see that what we've experienced so far is sort of like the 2006 period where there was a pullback in oil because of recession fears going into 2007. 
And what you saw in 2007 was a price spike. So oil had already gone to much higher prices than people expected in 2006. And you saw a big sell-off on recession fears. And so going into 2007, you saw oil prices start to rise because of this sort of surprisingly higher demand. And over that time, like you're saying, on an inflation-adjusted basis, we got close to $200 oil um, as there was just capitulation, as people accepted that there was stronger demand than expected and prices moved to a point where demand was essentially killed by such high prices, especially in such a weak economy. So what I'm describing is actually sort of similar. We just haven't had that 2007 to 2008 price move yet. So, and again, I don't know that we end up in sort of a dire economic straits. I think it's really complicated and people have too strong views on these very complicated dynamic economic systems globally, but I think it is easier to track uh, this fuel that's used for people to travel from point A to point B. And that has a long run demand trajectory of growth of sort of one to one and a half percent a year over a multi-decade period. And over the history of oil consumption, it's grown by much more than that. And I guess just the one other thought is that when you look at periods of demand destruction, so you look at COVID, um, you look at the global financial crisis, you look at uh, other sort of downturns previously, when we've experienced brief periods of demand destruction, we've seen a growth in demand above trend for a period after. So you get back to that long-term trend, but you actually get this sort of higher or faster demand trajectory. I think people don't like not being able to drive or fly. And so, you know, again, I'm attributing a psychological aspect. I'm not exactly sure what's driving it. I just know that every time you do that, you end up with surprisingly high demand. Here we are, and despite this trend, and despite this having happened multiple times before, everyone's surprised that demand is high, even though the economy is a little weak. And so um, you know, we're starting to see what we saw in the US and China now. And it's just, I think people are really having trouble reconciling it. And you see many claims. I mean, you saw this last year, people saying that China was never going to reopen. When it reopened, they said, oh, China's demand has peaked, even though they had road, roads closed and they had flight bans. And here you are. And you know the Chinese economy is not doing great. And you're at, it looks like close to uh, peak or not peak, but you're close to all-time high demand in China for oil, and it's growing, and it's on a sort of rapid trajectory, even with weak industrial activity. So again, it's sort of, it's this really hard thing, I think, for people to understand that there are these periods of time where oil demand grows, even in a weak global economic environment, and we're in one of those times. And like you were saying, another of those times was the prelude to the global financial crisis. And in that prelude, we saw oil prices rise precipitously. And I think that we're sort of in a similar setup potentially, which would follow through with my thesis that we are going to see oil prices go to all-time highs. If if oil prices do go to new all-time highs, and I'm going to uh, come back to that before we end the interview, uh, what is going to happen to the rest of the S&P 500 index? Keep in mind that oil is a significant part of the index. So I'm wondering, is it going to pull up the entire index for a passive investor? Or is it going to weigh down on other sectors because input costs would rise and margins would shrink? What do you think? So, so the last I saw, oil was about, and energy stocks were about a 6% or so um, portion of the overall uh, S&P 500 index. So it's actually pretty small and it's historically small. I think we need to see oil and energy stocks sort of get back up to that sort of 10% longer term average level. And then probably in that sort of circumstance you'd see it get closer to 15 or 20% in the in the late 70s you actually saw energy stocks i think they got to a high of around 26 or 28% depending on exactly how you calculated it and exactly you know did it happen for a day or for a month or 6 months or so on so i think you could see energy stocks become a much larger percentage of the index they're not right now they're still pretty small um but i think they're too small to be able to overcome some of the negative aspects uh, and the negative ramifications for the broader indexes. So you look at companies that trade at very high valuations that are dependent on sort of, um, you know, a discretionary spend like uh, Apple, where people are sort of choosing to buy a new phone sooner or later. And you look at Apple's sales coming down, you look at Tesla, where they've had to cut prices over and over again. Um, you look at these various other companies and they're not really pricing in a higher interest rate environment, which is one of the things you experience with higher commodity prices. And they're also not really pricing in sort of 
smaller discretionary spending, especially on goods. And so I think in that sort of context, as we experience that, we may see a broad stock market decline while we also see oil prices and oil and gas equities uh, rally substantially. So um, I, don't, I don't think I don't think the the composition is nearly enough to be able to drag the index up. I think there's actually a lot of risk. And when you look at it from a historical perspective, like the one other aspect is that tech stocks, at least how they were calculated, let's say 20 years ago, are close to 50% of the market. So they've now cut it up. They're called communication and tech and biotech and a couple other things. But when you sort of combine what was in this sort of um, tech world or tech umbrella, um, you know, we're, we're at a or we were relatively recently at an all time high in terms of that percentage of the market, that that sector being that percentage of the market, I think that's sort of an unhealthy um, unhealthy weighting for the stock market. And I think it makes sense for companies that generate sort of more steady earnings and cash flow to represent a higher percentage. And then also for cyclicals uh, that were suppressed during this sort of tech boom and low interest rate boom, I think it makes sense to expect that those stocks would actually um, become a much bigger percentage of the market as well. So oil stocks, industrials, um, various other sectors, I think I would expect them to be a much higher percentage of the market. But the problem is that these other companies that are very high valuation, uh, very speculative, in many cases, very dependent on discretionary spend, I think those have a, a long way to come down and that would outweigh the, the benefit from higher energy stock prices. And are you expecting the new all-time highs to come later this year? I know timing is difficult to predict, but what would be the catalyst and when would you likely see it? Yeah, I, I don't know exactly. I mean, the again, the, the supply demand balances for later this year look terrifying. They look like oil, could, I mean, oil could rip higher this summer, and that could be it. It could take a while longer. There could be sort of more, uh, more of a demand uh, pause or downturn due to a more severe economic downturn ahead of that. It's sort of, I think it's it's sort of hard to know exactly when. But if you just look at the consensus numbers and the the range of estimates uh, for later this year, I mean, it looks it looks like it could be later this year. Even if I wouldn't say it's necessarily going to be later this year, but it is set up for that. And again, the longer oil prices stay at this low level, the fewer rigs are getting hired, the less the, the fewer wells are getting drilled, the less activity there is, the less production there's going to be going into the future. And so I think we're, we're actually setting up right now. I think policymakers are messing up. I think the Fed should actually be lowering rates and um, there should be sort of more loosening of financial conditions in order to particularly encourage natural resources investment, which is being suppressed right now. And I think one of the results of that is going to be actually higher prices as we get into this further undersupplied period. So I think it's actually sort of where <laughs> there's a policy mistake being made that's exacerbating a fundamental supply and demand issue. And it's just, it's very odd to see rigs falling and activity falling and likely supply falling um, into a period where there is sort of this consensus expectation of undersupply. I, I want to finally close off on talking about um, shifting energy priorities, especially in light of public opinion. Uh, you'll see that Germany shut down its last three nuclear reactors recently. Um, it was a long, contentious debate, and you know there's people on both sides of the aisle. But I'm wondering what could happen to the oil industry. I mean, nuclear power primarily used to produce electricity, but the oil industry, could that face similar public backlash in the future? Yeah, so so there's been there's been policy discussion both on the supply and demand side for oil in terms of trying to reduce or eliminate it. Uh, hydraulic fracturing is already banned in much of the European in in the EU, even though um, even though there's a lot of evidence that it doesn't really have a material environmental impact. And you have very sort of weird policies that don't seem to be very environmentally friendly, where uh, fuels like um, essentially, uh, I forget what it's called exactly, but you basically take wood, so you chop down trees, you compress it into wood pellets and you burn that. And that's, it, it generates tons of air pollution, but that's considered, uh, renewable and green. And then on the other hand, they're actually turning off nuclear power. So like you're saying, it's very sort of contentious and very sort of hard to understand in terms of that trajectory. There's a lot of risk that 
um, that, you know, uh, gas powered and diesel powered cars and trucks are banned or they attempt to phase them out. And there's also risk that we're seeing in the EU in terms of uh, limiting supply. Uh, we actually saw something in Canada recently where the Alberta regulator is reviewing an expansion of one of the oldest oil sands mines, which is very odd given the high percentage of the revenue from the province from that particular activity and the many decades that it's been ongoing with very limited environmental impact. So we're seeing pressure sort of both on the supply and the demand side. I think the interesting thing is, and we saw this a little bit last winter, when it comes down to it, ultimately people want to have their lights on and they want heat in the winter and they want AC in the summer. And so we're seeing higher coal consumption right now in Germany along with higher prices. And so I think I think you end up with a sort of circular effect where sort of the more you try to get rid of it, if you don't have a good replacement, which there isn't a good sort of reliable source yet of replacement energy and replacement heat and so on, um, you know, the more you try to get rid of it, the more you end up just with dirtier stuff that you're that you're replacing with. So I'm not really concerned in the medium term with oil demand destruction due to failing energy policies. I'm more concerned, and again, I'll make a lot of money from it, but I'm more concerned from a sort of humanitarian perspective, what the knock-on effects are going to be of radically high oil prices and insufficient supply. I mean, there are people who need this, who have scooters in India that want to be able to take their crops to market, who, you know, whatever sort of uh, circumstance, very poor people who have very specific needs who may not be able to afford those needs as gasoline and diesel prices rise to levels that I expect them to go to. So I think there's a real issue. And I think it's really unfortunate that we have, you know, Germany banning fracking um, while, <laughs> while also sort of burning more coal. Uh, so it's a real, it's a real issue. And it's not, I think, really environmentally driven. And it's, a uh, very uh, unfortunate humanitarian issue. Well, Josh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. You know, I, I, before we let you go, I I heard the argument that the somebody, many people agree with you. An economist I spoke to recently said that if oil were to rise, which he predicts um, with similar rationale as you, actually, it would significantly increase inflation and we'll see the CPI numbers go back up. Is that something that could happen? It could. I actually think that we're um, we're set up for deflation because of this sort of policy failure, and so I think we could see a situation where, for a period of time, and again, I don't I don't have a high degree of confidence in that, but it is conceivable that we could actually see higher oil prices and low inflation just because you know, when you look at the sort of biggest causes of inflation, a lot of it's been from this housing bubble and you see uh, construction of multifamily at all time highs, you see household creation at low levels, you're, you're sort of seeing this market clearing and sort of oversupply of households uh, and housing in the US and Canada um, and various other uh, jurisdictions, uh, same issue in China. And so I think I think you can sort of see a situation where there's actually room for energy prices to rise a lot and actually not trigger significant inflation. So I know, I know that sounds sort of weird, but it's just energy is such a small percentage in terms of direct cost driver to households and rent and other factors are such a, or owner equivalent rent are such a large factor. Um, you, I think you could see them offset. And then similar on the auto side, as car manufacturer ramps back up post COVID and as sort of there's more chip availability, I think there's a real argument that we see car prices uh, start to stabilize and come back down. And so if you see housing and cars decrease in price, or at least slow their increase, I think there's just a lot more room for energy prices to rise a lot without having a material impact on inflation. All right, Josh, I appreciate your thoughts. Very thorough analysis and overview of the energy markets. Thank you for your time today. Thanks for having me. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.